So good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's PestFax webinar. My name is Cindy Webster, and I'm the PestFax newsletter editor and project manager, and I'll be hosting behind the scenes today. This webinar has been funded by the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, NGIDC, as part of the RPM for Greens project that is mentioned on the screen. And just moving on to today's agenda, today we have three presenters and they are going to be talking about the following topics. So first we have Kira Beard, our plant pathologist based at the Geraldton Deephead office. Kira is going to be talking about foliar disease findings from surveillance conducted last year. Our second presenter is Jeff Thomas, who is going to be talking about this year's Greenbridge and what the outlook is for this season for foliar disease. He'll be followed by Ben Congdon, our deep herd plant virologist at South Perth. He'll be talking about aphids and this year's Greenbridge findings and what that means for aphids and virus risk this season. And we will be having questions and answers, questions and answers at the very end. <laughs> Excuse me, at the very end of the webinar. So please use the Q and A tool that's located down the bottom of your screen, and I'll be reading those questions out to our presenters for them to answer and just to try to keep our content all to time. Uh, the webinar is being recorded today and it will be made available after this webinar on the Deep Herd YouTube channel and will also be circulating the PowerPoint slides. We will be keeping all attendees muted just to try and improve our sound quality. And that will be it for me to now. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Kira to begin today's webinar. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Cindy. So I'm going to be speaking about the Crop Disease Surveillance Project, um, where a lot of the results that you're going to be seeing today uh, come from. So this project is co-funded by DPIRD and GRDC, and we conduct an annual integrated surveillance and monitoring program for diseases of cereals, oil seeds and pulses. We're looking for endemic and exotic pathogens, and we have a great team spread across the grain belt from Geraldton to Esperance, so I'd like to acknowledge them for all their hard work that provides the information that you're gonna to see today. So surveillance is very valuable um, as it helps us identify the current situation with broadacre diseases and viruses. And it also helps determine any new and upcoming disease threats. So it's useful for developing disease management strategies and research priorities. So we're gonna be looking at the 2020 surveillance results that we found last season. I'd like to thank other collaborators who contributed to our surveys from the RRA Agronomy Project and the National Hay Agronomy Project, particularly Kylie Chambers, who contributed a lot of oat surveillance, which is really valuable to add to our project. So the 2020 surveillance, we did a lot of um, commercial crops. You can see that we went to 341 commercial crops, 49 MVT sites, 32 trials and lots of roadsides. So the aim is looking for endemic diseases in all the different broadacre crops um, across the different CBH port zones. So we do ad hoc surveillance and also a quantifying survey in the spring. And that's what I'm going to be showing you today. As well as this, we're also looking for high priority pathogens um, because proof of freedom from high priority exotic pathogens is important for the WA grains industry um, to ensure market access. So that's part of it as well. And then we also do a lot of plant sampling. You can see here we collected more than 250 plant samples. Different leaves were collected for identifying diseases sent to the deeper diagnostic lab services and also for different surveys, such as the National Rust Survey by University of Sydney, the Fungicide Resistance Survey by CCDM, and DPIRD's Ramularia Barley Survey. So I thought we'd just start with a quick overview of the 2020 season. You'll um, recall we started out with some green bridge from summer rain, and there was some rust found on wild oats near Esperance. Then, Unfortunately, the season was a bit late to break in most areas and dry warm weather for much of the growing season did not favour many diseases or aphids. However, the wet August and November saw a wider range of diseases than in 2019. So in our spring surveillance, we um, covered a broad area you can see from Geraldton 
all the way down to aspirants, surveying commercial crops, and we assessed 25 plants per crop at each of these to gather incidence and severity data. So um, you can see this table just shows you that we covered lots in each port zone for each um, crop type, apart from oats and lupin, which were specific to where they're mostly grown. So now I'm gonna show you a snapshot of what we found. Um, the main diseases in 2020 at high incidence in the spring were high um, number of stubble-borne diseases. So this was similar to 2019 that barley spot type net blotch was found in 83% of paddocks across all port zones. Wheat, yellow spot ornodorum blotch was found in 77% of paddocks. And in Geraldton at least, this was predominantly nodorum blotch uh, where we saw gloom blotch in 30% of the paddocks that we surveyed. So the wet weather in um, August and also in spring in a lot of areas would have favoured the spread of nodorum. Then in oats, we found um, septoria avenae blotch, which is another stubble borne disease, was very high incidence again. And interestingly, bacterial blight was um, higher incidence at 65% of paddock surveyed in Kwinana and Albany. And the only rust that was found throughout the survey was found on oats. So this was um, interesting considering, considering we'd seen it on wild oats and the green bridge. Wheat leaf rust um, hasn't been seen since 2018 and we haven't seen wheat stem and stripe rust since 2015. So a limited number of chickpea paddocks were inspected, but all of them had high incidence of ascochyta and this was in the Geraldton, Quinana and Aspirant support zones. Other significant diseases found were sclerotinia in canola and lupins and this relates to the wet weather in August that a lot of areas had, which really favoured the disease getting going. So in canola, we found sclerotinia in Geraldton and Esperance, and there was also some blackleg and low incidence of powdery mildew in Esperance. So it's important to think of these for carryover for the coming season. In Geraldton, Lupin sclerotinia is a growing issue and we found it in 50% of the lupin paddocks that we surveyed. And there was some brown spot um, and BWYV and charcoal rot in lupin in Kunana. In um, Bali, net type net watch, interestingly, is mostly being found the last few years in Albany at high, um, relatively high incidence, um, but low elsewhere. There was low incidence of barley powdery mildew in Albany and Esperance. And interestingly, loose smut was very high incidence compared to 2019 and 2018. Wheat low incidence of powdery mildew, sorry, low incidence of wheat powdery mildew was found in Albany and Esperance. Um, but powdery mildew head infection at Esperance was quite challenging for growers to control and particularly in SBS variety sector. Um, so this is a concern, but Andrea Hills from Esperance sent samples to the fungicide resistance survey and um, it was confirmed it isn't fungicide resistance. It's obviously just important to manage the disease before it gets up into the heads because once it's up there, it's very difficult to control and you can't reduce it easily or at all. Um, Wheat flag smut raised its head in several areas and um, thankfully there were no high, high priority exotic pathogens seen in any port zones. So the key implications for 2021, what do we need to think about for this year's crops? As I said, stubble borne diseases are very common and high incidence. And we found in 2019, even after a dry year, they were a big concern. So risk of these will be continue to be moderate to high. Um, particularly of concern is spot type net blotch in barley, where it's been found in the low rainfall zone at high incidence as well. Uh, this is particularly concerning given detection of resistance to SDHI fungicides. And you need to um, yeah, carefully consider fungicide management and an integrated approach to managing 
that disease. Wheat powdery mildew in the aspirant zone, as I talked about, is an ongoing challenge. Um, then in oat crops, we saw rust after finding it on the green bridge in wild oats. So that's an implication that is important to, to know what's on the green bridge to outline what risks you might be um, facing this season. So Jeff Thomas is going to be talking about that shortly, what's been seen on the green bridge recently. In terms of diseases that were found at high incidence or um, occurrence in 2020, ones that we need to watch out for, barley powdery mildew is um, one to watch as it's got in altered virulence for the MLLA resistance gene. So continuous cropping of Rosalind will increase the MLA attacking pathogen population and it will reduce the mildew resistance of other varieties that possess this resistance gene, such as Spartacus as well. So it's important to um, yeah, be aware of this and to choose your varieties carefully and to use fungicides wisely and use an integrated approach. Lag smut in wheat and loose smut in barley can be effectively managed with seed dressings and variety resistance. So it's important to um, use those this year. Then in sclerotinia and lupins, we're doing some work this year as it is very hard to predict and we understand that growers have limited management options available at the moment. Chickpea ascochyta, last year, the, um, the role of seed borne inoculum was likely to be the culprit at causing it to be widespread. So it's important to use clean seed and use a seed dressing. And finally, for hay growers, oak bacterial blight um, was a problem last year and could be ongoing this year as it's spread from seed and stubble. Um, so it's important for growers to consider that as there's no chemical measures registered for that. So that are just some of the things that we've um, learnt from our 2020 surveillance. And I'll now be handing over to Jeff Thomas, who will be talking about Green Bridge survey that we've recently done. But the detailed results uh, that I've, I've shown you, just a snapshot of them, but if you'd like to see the detailed results of the 2020 surveillance, and also the Greenbridge surveillance we've recently done, you can go online to our website. This is um, just hot off the press, so it'll be available um, later today on this website. Over to you, Jeff, thank you. Thanks, Kira. Um, and welcome along, everybody. Look, as Kira said, I'm going to be speaking um, just, just for a short while about some work we've been doing looking at, at the Green Bridge this year um, and, and speaking briefly about what that might mean for this season. As Kira's uh, already told us, it's part of um, some surveillance project work that we have, DPIRT and GRDC funded project uh, into surveillance of diseases in grain crops. So just starting out, this is a map of the, uh, of the rainfall uh, for this season up till now, produced for me by Meredith Guthrie in the, in the climate group at, at Deepherd. And I guess um, we're not really, I'm not really telling you anything you don't already know, except for to, to point out that obviously um, this, there has been quite a bit of rain um, above average um, across the wheat, most of the wheat belt um, this year. And um, I guess, uh, you know, it's a, as we can see there, we're talking about sort of decile eight to 10 uh, rainfall across a lot of the wheat belt and significant rain happening in sort of February, March, and, and then obviously in April in, in, in many regions. If we have a look and if we think about the last 10 years, generally what we've, what we've seen is that seasons with sort of above average rainfall in March, which happened obviously in many areas this year, yeah, and we're talking about seasons like 2013 or 2015 or 2016 are years in which um, biotrophic diseases have been problematic um, in, our, in, in areas of our wheat belt. Um, and generally what we're talking about there is uh, rain that um, perpetuates the green bridge um, into, into the start of the cropping season. So we're getting an overlap of green material um, 
potentially hosting um, disease uh, in, with, the, uh, with the cropping season. And obviously we, we know that um, in seasons like 2015 and 2016 had um, diseases like uh, wheat powdery mildew being quite dominant. And as Kira pointed out, um, 2015, we saw a bit of leaf rust and even some stripe rust occurring um, in WA. So this year, what have we done this year? Um, at the moment, we've this this map just indicates uh, where where we have had surveillance occurring. About 150 sites have been visited, and by sites I mean uh, roadside uh, verges, uh, paddocks with with uh, crop regrowth um, across across as much as we can across uh, the wheat belt. This this surveillance is is ongoing, um, and we're always happy to hear of particularly of reports of. Uh, biotrophic diseases, so rusts and mildews that people might be finding on any on any regrowth. So what have we found? Well, obviously we found that yes, um, that rain has resulted in uh, significant amounts of, of green material, and that's both um, grain crop uh, regrowth and a lot of uh, weeds uh, and other plant species, some of which are um, going to be hosts for some some crop diseases. A couple of things to note. One is that um, the, the regrowth is anything from seedling regrowth from the most recent rain uh, right through to quite advanced um, and mature regrowth. So we've certainly got a, a perpetu uh, uh, an enduring uh, and perpetual green bridge, we might say, that is obviously intersecting with the cropping season because there's quite a bit of um, cropping activity already underway in, out in the wheat belt. The other thing that's been quite noticeable this year has been the amount of paddocks, stubble paddocks that are quite bare of regrowth. Um, and that obviously is a result of some uh, regular spraying of those paddocks. So I'm not, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that that uh, spraying has occurred to manage disease, but certainly a byproduct of managing weeds and, and maintaining soil moisture will be um, some uh, reduction in green bridge and reduction of risk associated with that green bridge. I guess the important question is what's on that green bridge? Certainly in paddocks where there is uh, regrowth in stubble paddocks, there is some evidence of um, necrotrophic diseases. You know, so we're talking about your yellow spots in wheat, uh, spot type net blotch in barley, uh, black spot in peas, um, septoria ravini and ring spot in, in oats. Um, the, the, the general comment from all of the people out doing the surveys is that those diseases are present, but probably not at levels that we might, um, we might, we might have previously seen. So potentially, um, whilst there has, been, um, there has been conditions which have been con conducive disease, maybe they're not, the, the heat that's been associated with, particularly through March, may have restricted some, some disease development. Of course, when we're talking about green bridge, we tend to, we're, we're really interested in those biotrophic diseases. Um, and so if we talk about, about oats, about, sorry, about rust, um, we haven't had, basically we've only had a couple of reports of rust and they have been, as Kira mentioned already in 2020, they've been associated with uh, wild oats in that Esperance region. Now, I guess there's a couple of things, a couple of points to make um, re related to that. One is, that and is that obviously that suggests that Esperance region, even though it possibly hasn't been as wet as some others, um, has had conditions which are at least conducive to um, rust development. And secondly, and, and possibly more importantly, is the fact that um, uh, weed regrowth, and particularly in this case, wild oats, are a, are a host of rust diseases for oats. And so therefore in those um, and we know that in the, in the areas where maybe oats are higher uh, inclusion in the rotation, there has been reports in our Green Bridge survey of plenty of wild oats. And so there is certainly a risk to oat crops this year for, um, for rust, rust to, to occur. The other, um, the other disease of interest, obviously, in terms of Green Bridges is, is uh, powdery mildew. And we've had a couple of paddocks uh, with uh, mildew reported already this season. Um, these are uh, barley regrowth in that Albany port zone um, reported by Kith J. Cena, and we're seeing powdery mildew on advanced uh, Rosalind barley regrowth. 
Again, a couple of points to make out of that. Firstly, uh, Kira referred to that MLLA uh, virulent uh, uh, mildew, and that is certainly obviously well established with, uh, with uh, mildew on this, this uh, Rosalind regrowth. But secondly, again, is, is the indicator that conditions along that south coast have been uh, conducive uh, for mildew, barley mildew, and we know that wheat and barley mildew, whilst they're different diseases, have similar epidemiology. So certainly, again, this is an indicator that of, a, of a risk associated uh, with mildew, and particularly for that southern uh, cropping region. Um, and we already know, as Kira's pointed out, that um, wheat mildew is a, is, seems to be a recurring issue in the Esperance port zone. Um, just quickly, um, obviously the other area that, that summer rain, people are interested in the impact of summer rain, rainfall is on, is on maturity, um, on maturity of fruiting bodies and release of spores for a range of those necrotrophic diseases such as um, yellow spot in wheat, uh, net blotch in barley, uh, black leg in canola, black spot in field peas. Um, there's been a fair bit of comment around about um, the, the rain over summer uh, may be uh, reducing the impact of, of that's those stubble borne diseases. It's important to note that uh, moisture, so rainfall and temperature combine to determine the maturity of the of fruiting bodies and the release time of spores. So the rain that occurred in February and March, yes, it's contributed to soil moisture. Yes, it's contributed to the formation of a green bridge, but probably has had a limited um, impact on maturity of fruiting bodies and, and uh, release of spores. Basically, if the, if the temperature is too hot for the fungus to grow, then, then the impact of that rain is lesser. Certainly those, uh, and that is why I guess often we see those, um, the maturity of, of things like uh, canola black leg and field, uh, field pea black spot occurring earlier on the south coast where the temperature temperatures can be cooler over the summer. Um, so so uh, I guess it's, the, the, the point to make here is that those cyclonic rains that, that occurred in early April, when temperatures were starting to dip, um, will have seen maturation on, on stubble uh, starting in many regions. And, and certainly we would expect, say, for uh, yellow spot, that the maturation process will have started in the, in the sort of central and, and northern wheat belt. And really, what happens from here will depend on the follow up rains um, through the last couple of days of April and into May as temperatures cool. But potentially there's a risk in early emerging wheat crops, for example, of um, yellow spot in those regions. Being conscious of time, uh, key messages. There is a green bridge out there, yes, and it's persisting into the season. And this, and we've had only a few detections of biotrophic diseases, but we know that seasons like this where there's March rainfall particularly uh, are years in which diseases have been problem uh, biotrophic diseases have prob problem been problematic. Maturation of fruiting bodies and release of spores is likely to progress, been progressed by early April rain and certainly is well developed um, on the south coast. And really, I guess the outlook is to monitor, monitor crops for the presence of disease, concentrate on those susceptible types and those early sown varieties where we're getting a good uh, crossover between the green bridge and, and the cropping season. And I think I'll pass on to Ben, who's going to talk about uh, virus diseases and, and in relation to the green bridge as well. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about uh, the first update for 2021 on our aphid and virus surveillance. Um, and this is part of a deeper boosting grains project. Uh, let's get this going. So aphid activity early in the growing season is driven largely by the amount of green bridge material that builds up following rainfall events occurring from mid to late summer and early autumn. Uh, these provide host material for aphids to survive and reproduce on. Temperature also plays a role in dictating aphid reproductive rate, the amount of winged individuals their populations produce and whether these winged aphids fly or not. There are likely a number of other dynamics at play that dictate risks that we think are important, but I won't go into these today. So rule of thumb predictions would suggest that based on rainfall and available soil moisture over the non-cropping period so far would make areas highlighted in green, blue and purple on this map the highest risk. 
And as many of you would know, there is ample Grand Bridge as, as has been um, talked about by Jeff in many locations within these areas, including well-established patches of wild radish plants, especially on roadsides, uh, which have dropped their taproot into the subsoil moisture. These are particularly common hosts for the canola aphids like cabbage aphid and turnip aphid, and also green peach aphid. I'll be talking specifically about aphid vectors of turnip yellows virus in canola, the green peach aphid and cabbage aphid, which we are finding frequently throughout the Albany port zone. However, there are many other viruses and many other aphid species that spread them that might pose a risk under this season's conditions. Aphids spread a whole host of viruses that can cause economically important diseases in our most important crops. These occur sporadically in WA. These include diseases caused by, seed, caused by seed borne viruses such as pea seed borne mosaic virus in field pea and cucumber mosaic virus in lupins, as pictured. These are also highly dependent on the seed infection level. Any grower concerned about the infection status of their seed can submit samples to DPIRD's diagnostic laboratory. Aphids also introduce and spread viruses into the crop that survive in external reservoirs of weeds and volunteers, such as turnip yellows virus in canola yellow dwarf viruses in cereals, as pictured there, and bean yellow mosaic virus in lupins. There are several other viruses that I haven't mentioned which can also cause issues given the right conditions. Generally, viruses do most of their damage when they infect large areas of the crop at earlier growth stages. This is a big reason why we monitor early aphid activity. Apart from yellow dwarf viruses, green peach aphid transmits all the viruses I have mentioned and is usually their most potent vector. So what have we found this season? So traps that were deployed by members of our Diamondback Moth surveillance team from mid-March to mid-April caught relatively low numbers of aphids at most sites. However, turnip yellows virus was detected in them at several locations. See the green markers on the map there. Uh, therefore, if flights of virus carrying aphids continue over the coming weeks, green peach aphid and turnip yellows virus could pose a risk to emerging canola. Very low numbers of eight green peach aphid have been identified on traps around uh, the Kunana West zone as well. Considering the exponential growth rate of this pest and the fact there is a lot of well-established host material coupled with cooling seasonal conditions, um, we encourage growers to monitor their emerging canola. Uh, over the coming months, we'll continue to be deploying uh, traps in collaboration with several grower consultants, including in the Esperance and Geraldton port zones. Growers in areas where green peach aphid is active and carrying virus that haven't yet sown their canola can help reduce impact of both the aphid and the virus by removing green bridge material surrounding the crop at least two weeks prior to sowing. They can also sow into standing cereal stubble. This helps reduce aphid landing rates and use a neonicotinoid seed treatment. So the key message is aphids are active in areas with green bridge material, including green peach aphid. Turnip yellows virus has been detected in them, especially in the Albany port zone. If these continue, they pose a risk to young canola crops. So look out for our continued updates on aphid activity over the coming months and also conduct your own in-crop monitoring and use an integrated disease management approach if in the high risk areas. Uh, thank you and for further updates, you can look at our Twitter. Uh, we'll be putting updates there. Pest Facts will be continually updating that. You can subscribe to that and Cindy will give you details for that. And also if you want more information on management, um, we have a lot of information on our website. And if you want to submit any leaf or seed samples for virus testing, you can go to DDLS's um, page and uh, fill out a submission form. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. And I'll just bring up the final slides for the webinar. So as Ben mentioned, um, we do have um, lots of useful links on the Deep Herd website that I've just listed on this screen. Uh, we do put out disease forecasts for field pea, black spot and canola blackleg at the link mentioned. And the surveillance project results will be available on the disease surveillance activities webpage link that's listed on the screen. We also, at, at the PestFax team, we'd love to hear about any reports of what you're finding in the field. If it's something that you see every year, we still want to hear about it. Anything new, um, we want to hear about it as well. And there's a variety of ways that you can send your reports to us. 
and you can even ask us for um, identification requests. We're happy to help out there as well. Uh, we have an app. You can send your reports through. Um, you can send it directly via email. Um, there's lots of ways. We just would love to hear from you. And that brings us on to the questions and answers session of the day. We have used our 30 minutes, but uh, presenters are happy to hang around and ask, answer any questions. So I'm just going to unmute our um, presenters now and turn on their cameras for any further discussion. So please use the Q&A tool to um, make any comments or ask any questions that you might think of. The webinar recording and PowerPoint slides will be circulated. And if you think of any questions or have any comments after this webinar, um, these are the contact details for our presenters on the screen. And now I'm just going to check. Um, yes, so Kirabit has already answered our one question. It was just in regards to um, if you have a crop disease uh, report from last year and you haven't shared it yet, and it might be relevant to Kira's work or to the PestFax work, um, what can you do with that information? Um, so basically, uh, Kira has already replied that it might be a little bit too late for to go on her web page with those surveillance results, but we still want to hear about what you found last season if you haven't shared already. And you can either share that info directly with Kira on her email address, or you can send it to the PestFax team, and we will make sure that Kira, Jeff, and Ben and the relevant pathologists are aware of what you are telling us. So we do all talk to each other in this department. So we're just happy to receive any information that you have to send through to us. So thank you for that question. And there are, as I mentioned, there's an app, the PestFax app. Um, email any way that you want to send it through is much appreciated. Okay, and I have a question directly for Ben. Oops, it might have been answered already. Okay, sorry, Ben. Yeah, I've got I've got some contact details for you to follow up for some aphid and virus information. I will send that through. Thanks very much for that question for those questions, Lachlan. Um, and the final question is: Is the outlook around Boyop and Darken similar to Albany? And Lachlan, I might just have to um, I'm just wondering if I can unmute you quickly. Uh, were you referring to aphid and virus outlook? I'm assuming as that question came in at the very end of that webinar, if you'd just like to quickly say in chat, yes. So uh, Ben, is the outlook for the aphid and virus risk around Boyop and Darken similar to Albany? Um, just based on, um, you know, if there, if there is large patches of, of what established wild radish um, or volunteer canola or other broadleafs, then there is a risk. Um, we don't actually have trap data from there, so we can't say exactly when uh, and where aphids are flying. But um, yeah, given given um, those other factors um, being there, then there is going to be some some risk. Yep. Very good. Thank you very much, Ben. And I think that we do not have any questions still there. And as I mentioned previously, previously, don't panic if you think of a question afterwards. Our team is around to answer them. So please, please feel free to contact them and we'll circulate the slides of all this information and the webinar recording. And one last check of the Q&A. No, we have no more questions coming in at the moment. So I think we will conclude today's webinar. I'd like to say thank you to everyone who has joined us today as an attendee. And I'd like to say a very big thank you to our presenters, Kira, Jeff and Ben, for taking the time to present today. And I'd like to thank Jeanette Pratt for joining us as co-host today as well. Oops. Sorry, we might have to have something just popped up in the chat box at the last minute. Um, I think it says someone saying thank you. So. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank they you. appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you for those positive comments. And I think that's that's it for now. Like I said, we'll circulate these um, PowerPoint slides and we'll put the webinar recording on our Deep Herd YouTube channel in the near future. And for now, we will say goodbye and I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for coming along today.